Dear colleagues, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Let me first uh, welcome all of you. Uh, delighted to see that uh, we have um, a lot of registration for this webinar. This webinar is actually part of a webinar series organized by UNDSP Informal Economy Facility, which is zooming on the opportunities and the challenges surrounding the informal economy in the context of so-called green transitions. As some of you would uh, recall, our past two webinars in July and September touched upon the criti critical role that informal actors, more than 20 million of them actually, are playing in waste management and circular value chains. Um, we will put a link to the past events in the, in the chat box soon. We notably heard during those two events about the important work conducted by several country offices, such as Vietnam and Paraguay, and other organizations to protect and to leverage the contribution of informal waste workers engaged in these value chains. Today, our intent is to move a little bit upstream and discuss how informal actors could be meaningf meaningfully engaged in policy processes related to climate action and green transitions. And this is not common practice, yet uh, if one wants to be serious about creating just transition strategies, informal workers, informal businesses, which in many countries are the backbone of the economy, should be placed at the center of the debate and remain involved throughout the decision-making process in ways that, of course, suit local conditions. Considering both their potential and their concerns can help governments devise policies that not only can support lower emissions and transitions to low carbon economies, but also to reduce vulnerability and inequality. Dear colleagues, today we'll hear perspectives from our inclusive growth team at uh, UNDP's regional hub in Africa. And in 2022, um, I would like to mention that in 2022, our team uh, organized actually a pioneer uh, policy dialogue on informality issues that brought together for the first time representatives of the informal economy and policymakers. We will also learn about UNDP's climate promise approach to stakeholder engagement in the preparation of nationally determined contributions, NDCs, with a particular focus on engaging marginalized groups. Our speaker from uh, VICO and our colleagues from the BPPS governance team will also share additional insights on challenges and promising approaches for a meaningful engagement of informal actors. Dear colleagues, we are, of course, looking forward to hearing from you and trusting that the webinar today will promote more opportunities for further thinking, for networking around this important topic. Let me thank all our speakers. And without further ado, let me hand over to Ms. Laura Alfers, um, Director of Vigo Social Protection Division and our Senior Advisors at UNDP's Informal Economy Facility. Dear Laura, over to you. Thank you so much, Natalie, um, and welcome to, to all our participants today. It's, it's great to have you in the room for this uh, third webinar. I am going to start off with a short presentation um, just to ground us in the topic uh, before we, we open up to our um, scheduled speakers and, and our discussants. So why have we decided uh, on a webinar which focuses on just transitions and the voices of informal economy workers? First of all, what do we mean by just transition? And I think it is uh, fairly common knowledge that, that a just transition refers to the demands from workers whose job security is under threat as economies transition away from fossil fuels and towards renewables and greater environmental sustainability. But the difficult area is really the word just um, and what justice means within this transition. Uh, can be understood in different ways by different actors. Um, and sometimes 
even though something is called uh, part of the just transition, uh, element of justice is missing. A truly just transition should recognize and address global inequalities and leave no one behind. Something that speaks to the goals of the UNDP. So why the informal economy? And we know that informal workers make up over 60% of the, of the global work, workforce. Uh, we also know that informal employment or employment is one of the key pathways um, out of poverty and can reduce inequality um, if decent work is provided and available. Um, and ensuring that the employment that is created in the world or that people are taking up um, allows for the exit from poverty and for reducing inequality is one of the great global challenges that we face. So addressing informality where incomes are precarious, risks and costs are high and protections are low should be key to the agenda, um, any agenda which seeks um, justice and which seeks a movement away from poverty and inequality. Within the move towards more sustainable economies, the move um, to, to sort of greener economies, um, workers in the inf in informal employment will be affected. Uh, there is an idea that perhaps it is only formal workers in large petrochemical industries or in mining who are going to be affected. Um, that's not the case. Uh, we need to look all the way down the value chain um, to, to, to the workers who are outside formal employment relationships. Um, some of the examples that we can name, uh, for example, is consumer backlash against fast fashion. So, you know, that, you know, not that this is necessarily um, something that's that's bad. I mean, this is part of the problem, right? Is that things that move us towards a greener future may also mean the displacement of, say, home workers um, who are working in their own homes to produce this fast fashion. Uh, laws around plastic packaging and so on um, might, might mean a reduction in packaging, which might change the way that waste pickers um, can make an income. Similarly, with you know, things around electronics um, and, you know, the fact that electronics are made to be more reusable might mean that lower down in the market relationships where informal workers have carved out a niche for themselves doing that, it might mean that that niche no, no longer exists. So these impacts do exist. Um, I think as well around reducing transport emissions, um, you know, many informal workers are reliant on, on certain forms of transport, um, changing locations of production, all of this will have knock-on effects. And, and even in the policy shifts, you know, that get the most policy attention, uh, like mining and petrochemical production, um, there are still informal workers in the value chains or who provide services to these industries um, whose livelihoods may be put at risk um, by the changes that are happening. The key problem is, um, and certainly we noticed this as we were preparing for this webinar, um, trying to find you know, research and evidence on, on the role of informal um, actors in, in the green transition. There's, there's a dearth of, of uh, data and research on the issue. Uh, and there's also a dearth of spaces for meaningful engagement with workers in informal employment. So the idea that we are moving to a just transition is might be a, a, a positive one. Um, but at the moment, the, the data, the research and the spaces for dialogue um, for, for a large part of the global workforce uh, simply is not there. And, and that is the problem that we are pointing to with this webinar today. The big question then, is how do workers in the informal economy become part of the solution instead of part of the problem? How do we switch that framing around, you know, we've got this huge excluded workforce. Um, if they're not included, it's, you know, it's a problem. We don't know how to include them. So how do we, how do we sw switch that around? We did come across a um, very interesting publication by Blakovich et al. Um, uh, looking at the issue of what a just transition would look like from a global south perspective. And, and this really was one of the only sort of systematic pieces of research we could find um, on the topic. Um, using country examples um, from Ghana, Colombia and, and Indonesia. And a key framing of the report, uh, sort of one of the underlying issues that, that the authors really raise, 
is that the just transition discussions have so far been an almost entirely dominated by a global north perspective. Um, and that there is a real need to bring in the perspective of developing countries in the global south into these discussions. And within that, what was interesting about this report is that it highlighted the presence of large informal economies as one of the key differentiating uh, factors between the global north and the global south. So their answer after after the sort of research projects that had um, that led to the report was that there were three sort of key um, areas of work that that need to guide a just transition um, in in the global south um, in developing countries uh, with informal workers. The first is around establishing ownership and leadership of the just transition, and that really focuses on particularly the role of the state and the role of government departments, the need for multi-stakeholder partnerships, and so on uh, within within the government in particular, with the government taking a strong lead, national, national government. Um, but then a second area of, of importance was, was the, the second one of uh, co-production and collaboration. And this is really where the issues of dialogue and working with the local knowledge and expertise of, of workers in the informal economy, but also other potentially marginalized um, groups or groups who are going to face difficulties in this, you know, thinking through the processes by which these groups' voices could be actively brought into the policy making um around around the dress transitions and then a third a third area is that globally <laughs> um it needs to be recognized that the just transition is not just a global north phenomenon um that it is something that affects the whole globe um and that and that you know the context of the global south therefore need to be taken uh, into account in the way that we talk about just transitions they also come up with a, a very useful uh, set of guiding principles for national governments. I don't want to spend a lot of time um, going yeah, into this. Yeah, I think to... we need to hurry up a bit. Yes, I will. I will. Um, but just to just to show you that um, some of the you know the links between the guiding principles for national government as well as the socially inclusive processes. And then finally, just to, to highlight that workers in the informal economy have been mobilizing um, around the issue of the just transition, um, needing to recognize their contributions um, to, to climate um, um, mitigation, as well as to green economies, introducing a mix of social protection measures, innovating towards ensuring safer and healthier working conditions under, under um, conditions of climate change, and again, the last point of including workers in informal employment in planning and dialogue. So having said that, I will stop sharing and I hope now we have a good sense of, of the general direction of the um, webinar. And I'm going to hand over to Usman Iftika from, uh, who is policy advisor for inclusive growth at the UNDP's Africa Regional Hub um, who will be talking to us about some of the lessons from their innovative work on enabling policy dialogue for informal workers in Africa and the lessons this holds for the green transition. Over to you, Usman. Thank you very much, Laura, and thank you very much, Natalie, and uh, the rest of the speakers. Uh, welcome. Um, so as Laura mentioned, I'm a policy advisor with the Inclusive Growth Team based in Addis Ababa. Uh, by training, I'm an environmental and development economist, but I, I still think there's potential in me to become a really good person. Uh, but um, so my main work and the relevance to this is that I'm doing a lot of work in designing inclusive green and blue uh, growth portfolios at the country offices. And um, my, my presentation is not going to focus that much on the green side because I think that is almost inevitable from my side. Um, I'm going to focus more on the just and the justice part of it. So having said that, next slide, please. Whoever's controlling. 
Like it? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to start by telling you a story about this innovative policy dialogue that we at, at the regional level that we uh, organize. And um, this is just one example of the dynamic work that goes on in UNDP in Africa in the country offices. Um, and my aim is to try to be within 10 minutes, uh, Natalie. So I'll be I'll be very precise and very focused. So let's talk about once upon a time, there was this thing called COVID-19 pandemic. And in Africa, people began to notice that why is my garbage not being picked up anymore? What happened to that vendor on the corner over there? Why can't I get access to the goods and services that I had um, easy access to? And why is the formal economy also being impacted because of these closures and lockdown? So what we began to find out and, and this sort of like recognition began about hey, you know, this informal economy is not really a monolith or homogenous. It has multiple faces and it's found across all sectors and, there, and there's relevance to greening across all of them. So in response, what we began to hear is the increasing demands from governments asking us, who are these people? Where are they? And what do we do to help them let, recover? And how do we now leverage the strength of the informal economy? Because it's crippling for us to be um, not able to provide services. Next slide, please. So in parallel, uh, a few months into COVID-19, somewhere around September 2020, UNDP ILO agreed on this joint global framework for action. This also translated into a regional partnership framework, and we focused in on three particular topics, social protection, youth employment, and informal economy. Through this, uh, and maybe we were lucky, we put together a dynamic, multidisciplinary, like-minded team, uh, very committed. And there was something unique about the humility. Uh, that we brought to this collaboration, that even as development agencies, we might not have the full picture. And maybe the way to get the full picture of what's happening in the informal economy is to crowdsource different perspectives into uh, a dialogue. So the idea was to keep things very simple and deliver on one tangible, innovative, inspirational, and not necessarily an expert-led view on how you uh, harness the le uh, leverage the ILO tripartite approach and the UNDP facilitated approach. And so we came up with a, a, an event, a policy dialogue called Informal Economy in Africa, which way forward, and the theme of making policy responsive, inclusive, and sustainable. And basically the question we were asking uh, recognizing that we don't know everything and, and we're still learning, is what would happen to policy and how it would benefit the informal economy if we infuse it with their voices and their needs and their solutions? Next slide. So what we found out that indeed Africa's uh, informal economy is immense. It's just tremendous, uh, with about uh, on average 64% contribution to the GDP, 80 to 85% of employment, and often providing a lot of opportunities to the youth. But historically, what has been happening is that the informal economy has been treated as an outside and neglected and as a threat undermining the informal economy. So ways were looked at to eliminate it or criminalize it. Even alternative approaches, which saw in economy, kind of looked at it as one dimensional, that they were on the edge of vulnerability, poverty, high, low earnings, you know, bad condition, and they needed help to kind of get them to be able to survive uh, through access to basic social protection. Next slide. So, but ironically enough, in COVID-19, there arose this major counter-policy narrative uh, while recognizing the 
course, recognizing the precarious nature of the economy, people were amazed, how are these people surviving despite the closures, the lockdown? And we began to also hear about grassroots innovation coming out of Africa through our accelerator labs, talking about the innovation and the growth potential that they have. And that instead of it being treated as an enemy, they should they just deserve attention, investment, and support, and can actually spearhead the structural transformations. And beyond that, uh, tackling issues of formalization, we can use it to address the multiple risk against uh, African economies. Uh, and this includes the climate change aspects, right? And build broad based resilience that could include greening quite easily. So it became one of the most prominent questions during the COVID confronting African governments. What is the role of the informal economy peering into the near and the far future? And this called us into action. Next slide, please. So we did a lot of thinking. There was a lot of meticulous design about how do you go about doing something innovative uh, by bringing together all these different actors and, and bringing all, all these voices and perspective together in a way that actually is going to lead to something meaningful. So one thing we were sure about, we needed to engage the informal actors in a very detailed and long-term way to really understand their needs and their concerns and their priorities. And this was based on knowing that we didn't know uh, what we would get from it. There was a lot of emphasis on creating a safe space for a dialogue. Often, you know, I go to conferences and they talk about participation, the child participation, and it's like a one hour dialogue and, you know, nothing really comes and only some people speak up. And we also wanted to make sure that the, there was a gendered perspective that was had, that everybody had an equal opportunity to speak. And the way we went about it was we thought about interactive methodologies or methods for collective sense making and analysis that builds mutual respect and solidarity and harness a common understanding through direct interaction with the informal economy actors. You know, they, some of these people had never been in the same room together. And we didn't do a one hour or two hour. <laughs> we did this over two uh, days and two and a half days. And we took them away from the capitals. We went to Victoria Falls and, and, and we, we, we kind of broke away from the formalization or the, the, the you know, the, the regular, uh, work that they do. Next slide, please. So we were thinking about how we can go about coming up with a common understanding of the knowledge gaps. Um, we, we assumed that what is written in our UNDP programmatic approaches or even government programs and policies sometimes goes right over the head of the, the needs on the ground, that there's a mismatch going on. And what we thought the best way to do this was ultimately to focus on solution. Can you get a group of people who don't know each other to work together and build collective intelligence and common solutions that would trigger inclusion, greening, and resilience? And at the same time, we wanted to ensure that we allowed a broader community of people to be able to watch what was unfolding over time. And Natalie was also, uh, uh, I remember, participated in delivering some of that. Um, and finally, we also thought, let's make this serious. Let's also invite the AU and let's put some weight behind this dialogue. That it's not just a couple of agencies, but they have the weight of the African Union behind. Next slide. Um, Usman, just to say you have about three more minutes. So just to. I'm almost to done. Back. Yep. Okay. Yep. <laughs> so this is just a diagram re representation. So we, we had everybody sit around in a round table in a circle, uh, not for a kumbaya moment, but really so you have to kind of mix people together. And, and they sat with people that they normally didn't know. The orange thing 
is our work environment. In there, we figured out how do you uh, list challenges, the gaps, and solutions. Next slide. And this is us in action. You see there is this taped off area, and within that, through some very solid facilitation, we're trying to now work on floor mapping. Or what are the challenges? What are we starting off with? And we're trying to then work through a systematic way to come up with a solution. Next slide. And then we also used a crowdsourcing method. So there were four key areas that were chosen by the informal economy that were prioritized. And the idea was that each group moves in a circular way for, for really ensuring everybody's view is in every one of the breaking out session. Next slide. So this is some of the most interesting things that we found out. We found out that the informal lectures were not necessarily prioritizing formalization. They talked about being recognized. They want a seat at the table. They want representation, they want inclusion, they want respect, and they feel they can be a good development partner to us as an equal. They wanted social protection and rights, of course, but they said, think about other more bottom-up models rather than just giving us what you normally do. And let's create, co-create laws and rights and build cooperatives you know, that reflect our aspirations as well. In access to finance, they similarly talked about, you know, how do you kind of get people access to finance who you don't even recognize, <laughs> right? And then you don't have, uh, don't have collateral. How do you, so can you help us to come up with solutions, maybe at the cooperative level? And, and uh, you know, that will have these long-term you know, phasing over uh, formalization. And they were, of course, for, said that formalization for us is within this umbrella, that it should be people-centered, it should be systematic, it should be about co-created approaches that mainstream us and gender and provide us with the incentive to become a part of the formal economy. Because if we're a part of the formal economy, you will notice the, uh, the, the, the trigger towards inclusion, greening, and, and formalization over time. So next slide, and that's my last slide. So just some lessons uh, to share. It should be intuitive. So it is possible to design more innovative uh, processes, right? But these aren't like these one-off, one-hour sort of things. They take time. They're dependent on creating a very strong team within our agencies, and it's about sustained engagement, and then really thinking about the design carefully, right? How I'm going to create this safe space right, uh, for this inclusive dialogue, and that's also an art of design. But one of the key things in it is the facilitation that ensures that uh, we actually get everybody to, to hear. Once that groundwork is created, we, I, I, it was remarkable what I was hearing in that, uh, you know, that workshop. Um, there are a number of tools that are available that you can use to do this collective sense making, allowing multiple perspectives. We did floor mapping, as you saw, we did these innovative breakout sessions. And I think one of the key was this focus on solutions. Everybody wants to work together to solve the problem. We have a very problem-solving perspective among everybody, and we came together very well to do that. And final point, um, everybody, was that, uh, yeah, when you include the excluded, your policy and your policy-making uh, changes, so expected. Thank you very much. Thank you, Usman, for those... Uh insights from from that very innovative uh, innovative series um sorry my camera seems to have turned off <laughs> um next up we have sangji lee who is global technical specialist on ndc's green economy and the just transition 
uh, from the UNDP's climate promise. So we're moving uh, away from dialogue and voice to a little bit more focus, not, not totally, a little bit more focus on the just transition itself. Um, and thank you for being with us today, Sangji, and over to you. Um, hi, everyone, and thanks, everyone, for inviting me to this webinar. Um, as Laura said, I'm from the Climate Hub, and in my presentation, I'll be talking about how the UNDP Climate Promise has been supporting countries in integrating the just transition approaches into short-term and long-term climate pledges under the Paris Agreement. So really uh, switching the gear and talking more about the climate space. Um, so our team has been supporting more than 127 countries in designing and implementing their NDCs, the short-term climate actions and long-term strategies. And of course, the, the inclusivity and the just transition has been the backbone of our support. Um, we believe that as countries are continuing uh, to update and implement their short-term and long-term climate pledges, there is an opportunity to embed the principles and processes and practice of just transition within them as a way to drive greater climate ambition. So then what does just transition mean in the climate space? I know Laura talk, touched upon this in the very beginning, but as she mentioned, there's no universally accepted definition of just transition. It is a very context specific and locally defined concept. And this, this is also exactly why the stakeholder consultation is pretty critical because you need to have developed this common understanding of what just transition means for the country. But essentially, it is about recognizing that transitions can be disrupted and there should be delivered, delivered efforts to smooth this transition, not only to minimize the potential losses of the green transition, but also to understand what are the co-benefits of green transitions and how can we maximize the, these opportunities. So for UNDP, it's really about embedding this equity, justice, human rights uh, into climate actions. Um, our team has identified four entry points to really embed the just transition work into the climate work. So these are assessments. The second point is the stakeholder engagement, where I will spend more time to go more much deeper. And then there's also institutional policy and capacity building support, and then the finance. But as you can see, the other building blocks are also critical to make sure that the engagement that we're supporting is also meaningful. Um, so let's go to the engagement part. So as I mentioned, this is uh, particularly critical for the just transition discussion uh, because it's the process of vision setting and consensus building. Um, and this is why uh, important because it's a key condition to make sure that we're getting and securing broader public support for any climate action. We've learned from the history that without these processes, there will be a social unrest and protest, and all of this will ultimately uh, really slow down the process of decarbonization. This is also about acknowledging that everyone is the agents of change who share the responsibility of, of a green future and who can also bring out the innovative solutions on how to contribute themselves in, in the green net zero future. Um, so as part of this support, we have been supporting countries and in institutionalizing some of the stakeholder dialogue and consultations at the country level. So those examples can be found, for example, in South Africa, Antigua and Barbuda, where they do have a dedicated just transition working group and stakeholder consultation platforms. But this sounds like a very easy solution, stakeholder consultation, but of course there, there's huge challenges uh, with the stakeholder consultation. Um, I think as Usman has mentioned, the important question is how do we identify who's going to be affected? Um, especially when we're talking about the green transition that requires the structure changes, that requires decades of work and transition. There's a high level of uncertainty regarding the net benefits of the green transition, as well as the distribution of costs and benefits among the winners and losers, we call it. So here, if we talk about the informal economy, it is even worse because the informal economy is not accounted in the, any economic statistics. So it becomes very difficult to manage this transition when you cannot actually measure who they are. So uh, from the Climate Promise team, we've been supporting countries in understanding what are the socioeconomic impacts of this green transition and also to identify specific stakeholders through a lot of macroeconomic modeling so that we can see how the GDP, the employment skills and gender inequality will be affected with the particular green transition. Um, so if you look at the graph here, 
um, we've done a study in Zimbabwe looking at how those 12 uh, climate policy will impact the, the job creation in the country. So this is a particular scenario for the introduction of the efficient cook stove. And you'll see that most of the job, they will show the negative, uh, the positive gains, but you'll see that firewood collection, there will be a significant losses in the firewood collection. And this might sound like not a problem because firewood collection will lead to de uh, de uh, deforestation, uh, land degradation, so it is good for the climate. But if you think about the entire livelihoods that depends on the firewood collection, oftentimes in the case of Zimbabwe, those are women and girls, unpaid workers, who are basically relying on this firewood collection for cooking and to meet their energy demands. And if you look at this graph on the right side, those who are negatively affected the most are the women with the unskilled uh, workers, uh, of course, the informal workers. So this brings us to a question, okay, uh, climate actions when it is all very well intended uh, to reduce the carbon emissions, but you need to also take into account those, those considerations that who might be affected and how do we make sure to protect those people who might be negatively affected. Um, so there are a couple of challenges that uh, I think I'm sure everyone will agree um, that informal workers are more vulnerable in the policy shifts like the green transition, they do have a limited access, lack of legal recognition, marginalization, and so on. But we're also seeing their opportunities as well. Um, some new value chain will be created with the green transition, as, such as the recycling and the, in the space of renewable energy and green infrastructure. Um, so they may have some new access uh, to formalize their economy, or they may be part of this new, new work stream. Um, they also bring the local climate solutions but this uh, transition from the challenges to opportunities, of course, not automatic. Uh, it has to be followed by a lot of uh, proactive measures like capacity building, local initiative and participatory mechanisms as well. Um, so from now on, I'm going to talk about how then the UNDP Climate Promise team has been supporting those, those marginal groups uh, in the climate decision making, uh, focusing on gender, youth, uh, indigenous peoples and local communities. So starting with gender, uh, what will be the gender dimension of the climate actions? Um, as I said, just transition is not only about minimizing the losses, but also actively looking for opportunities to reap the benefits of green transition. We talk a lot about the job creation uh, potentials in the renewable energy. They say millions of jobs will be created if we're transitioning from the fossil fuel based economy to the renewable energy based economy. However, if you look very closely at the statistics, the jobs created will be mostly for the male workers, urban male workers, and only 20 to 25% percentage will go to female. So what does it mean? Uh, that means that the gender stereotype will persist. And if there's no proactive measures like trainings and capacity building provided to women, uh, they will, the women will not be able to really um, benefit from these uh, economic transitions and job creation potentials. So this is why it is important to understand the gender dimensions of the green transition. So as part of the Climate Promise team, uh, we've been supporting women to be part of the climate actions and decision making, and we have have organized multiple stakeholder consultations. Almost most of the countries that we support have the stakeholder consultations, where sometimes we have a very targeted uh, focus group discussion with the women's organization or even women-led organization to really hear their voices. Um, to give some example, in Sri Lanka, we have conducted a very comprehensive Sorry, stakeholder. Mm -hmm. Just to say you have three minutes left. Okay, Sorry. I'll, I'll go very quickly. Um, so Sri Lanka, we did, uh, conduct, uh, we did organize a stakeholder engagement, which had really made a policy changes. Uh, so with their uh, opinions and participation, now the government has a specific gender-related policy brief that helps to empower the women, especially in the agriculture sectors. And then they also develop the gender action plan that has a specific targets and, and action plans to really empower women in the green transition. Um, now, next, let's look at the youth. Uh, we know that more than 1.8 billion young people live in the world, and they are critical stakeholders in the green transitions and climate actions. But often when they are not specifically targeted, we are uh, inadvertently um, leading them to exclude from this to decision-making processes. 
So with the Climate Promise Support, we are supporting uh, many uh, youth representatives and youth uh, constituencies to be part of these discussions of uh, NDC policy making. Uh, for example, in Nigeria, we are working with thousand young people to really think about the innovative climate solutions. And there is also the Youth for Climate Initiative that we are working together with the Italian government to really uh, make sure the youth are being part of these discussions. Uh, just to give you a very quick example in Zimbabwe, uh, the youth have been very actively involved in the NDC enhancement processes. So more than 200 urban and rural youth representatives have participated in the discussion. This has led to develop the youth policy brief and also the development of the youth desk at the Ministry of Environment based on this ongoing consultations. And then now that they are working on developing a youth-centered waste transfer center in Zimbabwe, because they have identified waste center as an area where they could have a huge uh, job creation potentials, especially for young people. So we're providing training and capacity building for that as well. Uh, last but not least is the, the engagement with the indigenous peoples and local communities. We know that some of this climate change adaptation and mitigation actions could sometimes lead to uh, the displacement of the ILPC. We might be disrupting the indigenous knowledge and cultural heritage as well. So we are trying to engage ILPC in different stakeholder consultations. We're also supporting them to be part of the COP28, which is happening uh, later this year, so that they can be part of these discussions and raise some of the critical conversations that is important for their livelihoods. So um, I'm going to stop there. But maybe here, the, the last slide here is, how do we then reflect on this? Um, from our experience supporting 127 countries, We've seen a correlation between the, the NDC ambition, the climate ambition of the countries with the inclusive approaches that the country has taken, meaning that the more NDCs were consulted with the wider stakeholders following the whole of society approach, the NDCs that they have submitted to the UNFCCC tends to be with the higher quality, with the higher climate ambition. So I think this is also brings us the reason why the stakeholder consultation is critical for the just transition and green transition. So thanks everyone. Um, and I'm gonna stop here, but happy to answer any questions. Thank you, back to you, Laura. Thanks so much, Sangji. And, and lovely to see those um, pieces of research as well um, coming through from this work. Right, um, we have our final presenter, and that is my colleague, uh, Jane Barrett um, from WeGo. Uh, Jane is the director of the organization and representation program at WeGo based in Johannesburg in South Africa. Um, so over to you, Jane, are you okay to share your screen? Thanks, thanks, Laura. Um, I'll... Great. Right, okay. Hi everybody, it's a real pleasure to, to speak here this afternoon or this morning as it may be for a lot of you. Um, and it's also very um, timeous that this event is taking place as a delegation of 15 waste pickers make their way to Nairobi, um, representing the International Alliance of Waste Pickers um, at the Plastics Treaty negotiations, which are being convened by UNEP, the United Nations Environmental Programme. Um, it's, it's also very apt that it takes place uh, just a week after a workshop that was held in Johannesburg. And Sanji mentioned support from UNDP to the South African processes of consultation including um, support to tripartite processes in our national uh, dialogue forum, NEDLAC. And I want to just read to you, if you don't mind, a, a post that was made by a, a street vendor who attended a, this workshop last week. And I'm, I'm not sure whether it was a workshop that was directly supported by UNDP, but it may well have been. And this is what he said in his, in his WhatsApp report. Um, it is critically important, this is part of his report, 
for us as the informal sector to persuade the government as well as everybody involved in the action against climate change to recognize that climate change is not only a technical matter but a social matter as well. Comrades, honestly, I must say, I always heard of climate change, but I have never understood this as a serious phenomenon as it really is. And then he goes on to talk about um, the importance of motivation and persuasion of the powers that be. So I just wanted to share that with you because it links directly to both uh, Sanji's input as well as the very wise words from Usman. So just to, to start off with, the starting point of the question of participation in policy making has to be recognition that informal economy workers are already in organizations, that you know there's not a blank slate, that they self-organize very effectively all over the world. And then the next step to understand is that largely across the world, their organizations are not recognized. And I was interested to hear Usman's summary of the conclusions of the dialogue held across in, in Africa, where recognition was the number one um, issue for the participating informal economy, informal economy workers. Um, and the challenge is that even where there is consultation or participation in processes, the organizations are often just regarded as one of many stakeholders, just a group of people with interests who are called to the table at the behest of the policymakers. Um, and when they're called to the table, the approach is generally one of simply a fireside chat at best. At worst, it's, it's, a, it's a death by PowerPoint where there's just a series of presentations and at the end of the meeting, you know, that uh, the box is ticked and the consultation has taken place. And frankly, that kind of consultation, in, in our view, is, is more damaging than not having consultation at all. And finally, the outcomes of the consultations are not recorded as agreements. So they're simply recorded as discussions and then the policymakers pick and choose which points to include in the final um, policy that is produced. So just some pointers to a more meaningful approach. Firstly, the importance of, of not only recognizing the organizations of workers in the informal economy, but most importantly, to recognize the, the members as workers, first and foremost. And then once conceptually those workers are seen as workers, to apply some of the collective negotiation principles that would be accorded formal economy workers in trade unions. In other words, making sure that meetings have an agreed agenda and proper minute taking, that the language of engagement is agreed in advance and interpretation is provided if needed because you know, we take that for granted and maybe in a forum like this, but you will be amazed how often it happens that people are convened to the table and not only do people not have the, the confidence to speak up, but the language in which the consultation or the negotiation takes place is, is one which is foreign to the majority of the participants. Um, then each party to the discussion must have the opportunity to put their views. In other words, it shouldn't just be a chalk and talk from, from the front, from, from the, the people who've convened the meeting and the, the, the policy makers themselves. Um, and then the points of agreement and disagreement should be recorded in writing. So everyone should go away from the meeting or at least 
um, receive after the meeting um, the main points of agreement and disagreement so that everybody knows where they stand. And finally, if no agreement is reached, the parties need to agree on the next steps. Should we bring in a mediator? Is the, has the consultation ended with no agreement? Do we, do each, does each party have the right now to submit an independent report to um, the final decision makers and so on? So there needs to be some, some common understanding of what the next steps are. And of course, you know, what I'm putting forward here is quite a formal process. But, you know, Usman presented the possibility of conducting this process in a less formal manner. But even if it's done in a less formal manner and isn't a formal negotiation process, still the same principles should apply of an agreed agenda, record of decisions made, an understanding or an agreement of what will happen if no agreement is reached and so on. And then... We also need to think of some of the resource challenges that face informal economy organizations and their representatives when they do participate in consultations and negotiations. Firstly, there's the livelihood impact of taking time out of work. Um, secondly, very often the organizations don't have the resources to transport people to to meetings to transport the representatives. If the meeting runs over more than a day, then you know the, there's the question of resources for overnight accommodation. And then there's also the question of resources for report back meetings to get new mandates. And you know these might seem like terribly obvious points, um, but they are also very, very important because they could be significant barriers to the, the participation of representatives in policy making. So it's really important for the conveners of processes to check out in advance with the organizations, you know, how will they get to the meeting? Will, will there be a need for accommodation and, and so forth, and if necessary, to find the resources in order to meet those needs. And then finally, just a concluding comment, and that is to say that if the process isn't just, in other words, if people leave the process feeling uh, unheard, feeling um, intimidated, feeling like they were unable to raise their, their views, then it's very likely that the outcome itself will not be just. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much, Jane. And I think a, a very um, succinct and strong reminder about the importance of proce process um, when we are talking about um, giving voice to, to actors in the informal economy. So thank you for that. I'm going to hand it over now to um, Julia Kircher, our discussant. Julia is a senior expert at the SDG 16 Research and Policy Engagement on SDG 16 Research and Policy Engagement at the UNDP Oslo Governance Center. Um, and I think at the moment you are actually in New York, Julia. It's uh, wonderful to have you with us. Jane, uh, I wonder if you could stop sharing your screen. There should be a stop sharing button. Thank you. Um, and over to you, Julia. Welcome. Hi, everyone. And thanks so much for having me. Um, this has been uh, very interesting. And I've been uh, taking notes and um, reflecting uh, on everything that uh, the colleagues have shared. Um, the, just to to um, reiterate, I am the the team leader for research and innovation at the Oslo Governance Center, which is which is actually now the Global Policy Center for Governance. Uh, the, the the updated name uh, of this policy center, and it's part of the governance team uh, uh, in in UNDP. Uh, and it's I have to say, first off, it's just so um, amazing to see how on this issue. Uh, you know, 
all of our silos within UNDP uh, are breaking down and we're coming together because we've got colleagues here from the environment side, from the inclusive growth side and uh, uh, governance from the governance team it's uh, it's just really good to see and it shows how these things are so um interconnected and how we all have something to contribute and hold some of the the experience and information and i'm sure it's the same among colleagues um that have joined online um so thank you so much for organizing this i've learned a lot already i just wanted to flag a few things that i've heard in all of your presentations and reflect a bit on those and then <coughs> share some of the things that uh, we've been <coughs> or we are working on um including with some of you uh to uh, support this this kind of work um of voice and uh, participation of uh especially marginalized groups um, so one of the things that came out very clearly, I think, from all the contributions is that um, it's not just about uh, doing participation or consultation as such, but how to do it, right? It's essential. And Jane, I think, put it uh, very clearly, it can be worse if you do it badly. Um, and uh, the... In, in my experience, and I think you've, you've all mentioned that as well, is that it's often not that government who's kind of supposed to organize these, these participatory uh, processes to develop their policies um, don't want it. Some, some are a bit apprehensive because they think, mm, what's going to come out of this? But actually, when you talk to government partners, they're not actually against it. They do want people uh, on board and supportive of policies, obviously, because otherwise it's going to be harder to implement them. Um, but they often don't know how to do it. Um, and for example, who to invite? Sanji was saying, like, who we don't measure if we don't know about people, especially informal workers who, by definition, aren't being uh, seen, counted, uh, part of systems, right? They're often not counted. How do we know how to reach out to them? And this is this is in. Um, in countries that uh, UNDP works uh, programmatically in, but I've made that experience, I've had that experience even in Germany. I was working on the SDGs in Germany and I was stunned to sit in some of these meetings and realizing that's completely the wrong people were sitting here. And then the result of the discussion is of course very affected. So um, it's across countries and uh, countries have to learn from each other. And in fact, I thought that in Germany uh, they could We've learned about uh, some of the approaches, for example, in South Africa and so on. So um, it's about the how and uh, who to invite. Um, one thing that came up across your presentations as well is um, the the cost aspects, um, both for the people who are invited. Jane made that point at the end um, because uh, they give time uh, and uh, yeah, uh, especially time. Um, but also it's an it's a concern of uh, government partners often. They say, oh, this takes time, this costs money, we have to bring all these people together. And it's true. I don't think we can downplay that. <coughs> but um, the, the, uh, the, the reverse is also that if we don't do it well, um, if we do it superficially, as, as I said in the beginning, as you all have said, the money that we are putting in is wasted. So we might as well do it well, and at least the money we're investing is 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 uh, gets us somewhere, right? Uh, has a result. So that's the 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 cost aspect. And just a, um, as a um, as an illustration of of this idea that you can make it worse, I remember uh, working on um, uh, fisheries crime uh, across regions, and there were stakeholder engagements uh, also with informal workers, fishermen in that case. Now, I remember in the Carib in a, in a Caribbean country, we had a situation where um, the the government partners were quite uh, patronizing um, to the people in the room that they were consulting with. With, and these fishermen, they just walked out. So then there was the the uh, an NGO and UNDP colleagues kind of hushing around, trying to get people back into the room and and mending the the tensions because that would have been worse. They would have been worse off after the consultation than before. And uh, it's often not so much even about 
uh, money, yes, DSA or, you know, to be somewhere is one thing, but Usman mentioned it in the beginning, it's respect as well. Like these fishermen in that case, um, they just felt talked down to. And they said, we have something to say. We're not going to, we don't need that kind of conversation if you're talking to us like this. So it's not just money. It's also things like soft things like respect, right? One last aspect I wanted to throw in before I just mention a few resources as well um, is uh, we, we've now seen it, and that's maybe something that didn't come out so much in the discussion yet. Uh, we've talked about it a lot about, in this case, informal workers uh, versus those that are organizing the consultations and often policymakers. But what's also important to consider, I think, is the dynamics between different stakeholders. So in this case, it could be um, informal workers and formal workers, because, you know, often informal workers are seen to be perhaps more competitive, right? They don't cost as much. So, uh, you know, there may be a tension, a competition between different kinds of workers. And also um, what we often see is um, <clears throat> tensions in the room between private sector actors who have a lot more negotiation power with policymakers and civil society organizations uh, or, you know, representatives, for example, of informal workers. So <clears throat> that's not to be underestimated either, I think, that it's not just the state uh, people kind of uh, dichotomy, but there's dynamics between uh, stakeholders that those who organize uh, participatory processes need to be aware of. <clears throat> who feels comfortable to speak up? Who has uh, uh, a stronger voice in the room, right? Uh, who can dangle money, for example, and who cannot? Um, or power, simply. So those are just a few reflections that were triggered by what you all have shared. Um, and uh, I wanted to mention that um, there basically all of these issues uh, are reflected in a tool that uh, we developed uh, a few years ago with DESA, UNDP and DESA, and I'll put the, the links in the chat in a minute, um, which is uh, about uh, what is a good practice in participation and uh, stakeholder engagement. And it it doesn't talk about just transition, green transition. It doesn't talk about informal uh, workers. But uh, interestingly, while you were all speaking, I realized that there, a lot of the issues are reflected there. So it's a it's basically a matrix that touches on uh, key, in fact, human rights principles, inclusion, participation, and accountability, but breaks them down into uh, much, much more specific aspects. And uh, it gives you a chance to rank your practice that you're looking at from zero to three. Like what is a, a little bit good, what is very good, working very well. No? So this is a framework to analyze the quality of stakeholder engagement, precisely what we were saying, like how to do it, not just to do it. Um, so I'll share that. And then more specifically on, on um, fair green transition, on just transition, um, to flag that next week UNDP's um, uh, Sustainable Energy Hub is uh, launching its energy governance framework. And I'll put the registration uh, link in the chat too later. And um, it has four dimensions. Um, and one of them, uh, the, the dimensions are inclusive and effective institutions, legal and regulatory framework, and then the third one is civic engagement and empowerment. And the fourth one is appropriate and independent oversight. Um, and, but the third one, the civic engagement and empowerment is a very strong and important one. And when you see the, the framework um, next week, you will see that it draws on uh, previous experiences in um, UNDP as well. And for example, a study in by the Accelerator Labs in Latin America on um, citizen engagement. And some of the things that you've discussed already today are uh, really reflected there, like moving from consultation to collaboration, um, starting from a citizen centers perspective, complementing engagement with empowerment, like what, what means and what power do people bring to the table, and building in commitment, for example, to be responsive. So a lot of these issues uh, are more focused there on fair green transition. And that's good. That can be a basis for all the work that uh, we do on this, um, this framework. It points to those key issues. And we've started, lastly, last point, we started using this framework already internally. Um, and we, meaning um, Sanji, is part of this from the Climate Promise team, the, the um, Energy Hub is part of this, and the governance team. 
um, to now uh, develop uh, a bunch of case studies to see how do governments actually manage a, a, a fair green transition. And of course, participation is a, a big aspect in this. So we're using that framework and we're going to um, uh, put out uh, an initial um, discussion note on this for COP28. So watch that space. Um, and there's also an initial think piece that we've uh, put out earlier this year that I put in the chat. So it shows that there's um, there's a lot of thinking about this, uh, often not specifically on informal workers or perhaps not even in, in just a uh, transition, but uh, with a lot of uh, relevance for the points that we've discussed here. So I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you. And I'll put the, the links in the chat now. Thanks. Thanks, Julia. Um, I think a, a crucial point um, about the, the sort of power dynamics between uh, different groups within the dialogue as well, not just with the state. Um, and also really highlighting some incredibly useful resources that sound like they're emerging from the UNDP. So absolutely, it would be great to have those in the chat. Right. We have about 20 minutes um, for our discussion. I have two questions already that have come through the chat and the Q&A box. Um, if anyone would like to add one more question to the round, um, I can make it three questions to our panelists. I think you can raise your hand and I should be able to see you. Ah, Madalena, uh, why don't you ask your question, uh, Madalena, and then I'll come in with, with some of the other questions. Over to you. I'm Madalena from uh, Kenya Country Office. Uh, uh, this is a very interesting discussion. I'm happy that I got the uh, time to join in. It's always difficult to attend a number of these useful webinars. So this is really very important and timely. So that's very good. I think all the content is very good. I look forward to get the, to get the information because indeed uh, countries have run, are running with the uh, topics of just transition. I don't think there is this kind of uh, comprehensive understanding of what it actually entails. So it's really very good that uh, we get more understanding on that. I just want to reflect on, I was in Zimbabwe, by the way, so it's good about using the Zimbabwe experience. I just want to reflect and say that indeed some of the issues with the informal workers is that uh, it's not easy to identify the alternatives. And, and those alternatives, it's not just about uh, saying, I don't know, yeah, you can do you know, recycling or you can do waste collection and things like that, uh, and then leave it at that. You know, It's really a process. Just the same way they have invested in whichever mechanism they were doing, the transition itself, they need to be supported. You know, there's a whole uh, infrastructure that needs to be put in place. You know, if you look at waste transition, the mechanism for recycling, even how do they uh, get markets for those? You know, for for the for the new, uh, you know, different uh, uh, items of waste segregated. It is just really a process, and and when we direct them to 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 those pointers and leave them there we wouldn't have done our part and and i i know this because i'm just using some of the examples from zimbabwe and west collection is obviously the easiest example but the whole chain of where we are directing them into it will require commitment you know both from us and and from whichever partners are supporting them for to just that uh, we 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 demonstrate that they indeed able to make livelihood and value from this alternative, uh, 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 you know, uh, clean energy sources of income of em or employment that they are that they're, that they're going into, and it's a process. So we, it's very good investment what we are doing so far, but we also need to recognize that it's a process and that we we accompanying them to accompany them throughout the journey. Otherwise, unless they see the success, it's very difficult for us to convince them just through the narrative. Uh, I think that's. Uh, one point. The other point I want to say is that it's good, yes, with the NDCs that we are developing, and I really am happy with a lot with the investment that UNDP corporately is, is uh, investing in, into countries through the climate promise. So yeah, these issues of, of dialogue and consultation and ensuring that the NDC are inclusive, obviously, is the first entry point. But to actualize then, to roll out the implementation of the commitments in the NDC, I think it's important. I want to agree with the uh, last or the, the, the one before last speaker who has talked about the consultation needs to be more meaningful. Because indeed, you know, we gather them, we consult, and 
and we really don't, for, for some, uh, at least I can say on the youth voices in the NBC revision, those who are tangible and a number of their recommendations were taken on board. Not all, not, the, the, there's not usually such a um, structured process in taking in the, the recommendations out of those consultations. So we also just need to pay attention. So I, maybe I'll just stop here. Thank you. Thanks, Madalena. So um, a comment really on, on needing to make sure the alternatives um, come through. I see more hands. Let me hand over to our participants because we have three questions um, or, or comments. The first question is from Hari, who says, is dialogue sufficient in itself? How do we ensure actual influence on decision making? Um, making decision making more democratic going beyond just you know we're, we're talking about dialogue and how to do dialogue but how do we get that to to change change decisions change decision making uh, we have a second uh, question from osama um, pointing out that in sudan the economy has collapsed due to conflict um, so are, is there guidance or examples on how to address livelihood needs in this kind of context with a view towards building uh, a more formalized green economy. And then I think uh, a third comment, um, and perhaps uh, one of you would like to speak to it about um, the alternatives and you know how we how we work on the alternatives for the informal economy. So um, perhaps uh, participants, uh, our panelists, you can just un unmute yourself and 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 start. Osman, you look like you have something to say, so. <laughs> um, I was going to suggest uh, letting my colleagues go first, but I could, uh, of course, go first as well, too. Um, let me pick on uh, what Hari said. I think that's an excellent question posed. Um, and, and from our point of view, from our planning, this was just the beginning of the consultation, right? And we held it at a very uh, regional level. And so we were experiment and the experiment worked, I think in this case, where, and maybe it was luck where the right people came together to do the right thing at the right time, you know? Um, and so our, our approach is also that, but this wasn't enough. The whole action plan that emerged from it, uh, the, um, uh, the the consultation, and uh, of course financing is important to in order to be able to carry that out. But part of it was to set up these digital platforms to have uh, continued discussion. And then some of the ideas was to take the roadshow down to the country levels and even down to the local level, where you can have a lot more. Uh, uh, meaningful engagement with people and the policymakers who are at this place, at the scene to do this. So, yeah, I, I think the approach is to democratize policymaking all the time, uh, but it, 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 you know, it's somewhere. And sometimes you have to do uh, the experimentations and testing to get to it. Uh, you know, there's no I, I think there's no, there is a and broad outline of what I presented on how to do it, but I don't think it's a form, formulaic. I think it's uh, just giving you guidance on how you can think about it, but over from my side. Thanks, Usman. And I saw Sangji nodding, nodding at Madalena's comments in particular, so perhaps you'd like to speak to that, Sangji. Of course, um, great and, and great to see Madeleine, who has been the champion of our work in Zimbabwe. So thank you so much for the comments. And I think her comments actually answers partly the question raised by Harry, right? Is dialogue enough? And I think one of the points that she raised is to importance of having the success stories where this meaningful participation and engagement has actually led to a policy change. So I have given an example of uh, Zimbabwe where the youth has been part of the discussion but it didn't end there, right? Now they have a youth policy brief and now they even have the, the desk at the Ministry of Environment. They have a youth task force and now there is a specific training and, and capacity building support being provided to generate jobs in the waste transfer sector in Zimbabwe. So I believe we need more and more of these, these uh, conversations and success stories. And of course, as I mentioned, stakeholder engagement is one pillar, one building block of the support, of course, but it has to be followed 
by the assessment, the evidence, but also the institutional policy capacity building support, not to mention the importance of the finance. And one interesting point that I think Mad Madalena raised about the, the waste sector, we talk a lot about the waste sector when we talk about the green transition and informal economy. It is not just about you know, creating the jobs in the waste sector, but also to make it more attractive to young, young people, for example. When we're having a national stakeholder consultation in Zimbabwe, one of the youth representatives basically mentioned, okay, there will be millions of jobs created in the waste center, but it is not attractive to us. Simply that's it, right? You should also, import, it is very important to also understand the social capital, right? How do we make sure that the, the general understanding, the cultures embrace this new jobs and green transition opportunities? So those human, financial, and social capital, they're all very important to make this meaningful uh, dialogue and consultations. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks, Sangji. And I see Natalie's um, hand is up. So Natalie, do you want to come in on this? No, this is a fascinating conversation, and I think it's just the beginning. And as I said, when I started, um, none of this is common practices yet. And as mentioned by Usman, we are still uh, very much experimenting with this. But actually, I have just a, a, a quick question. It's through, we've been talking about workers, workers, informal workers. But from my perspective, the business sector and the informal business sector Informal MSMEs are also potentially unseen champions in the green transition. And I, I would like to get back to all the colleagues on the panel uh, to see, perhaps to give some brief insights on how they see the engagement on informal businesses uh, uh, in, in policy process related to just transitions. Because there are platforms to engage the business sector, right? And the formal uh, business sector, what about the informal micro small enterprises, which are also job providers? Some of them are already engaged in green transition. Some of them, their, their, their potential could, could be leveraged as well. So it's just flagging this because we, as I was saying, when we think about engaging the informal economy, it's both, of course, workers and their representations. And as we learned from Jane, they are most of the time organized, what about the informal sector as such? Mm. I mean, like informal businesses. I'll stop there. I'm not saying we should uh, reply today, but I think that's important as well. It is important. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Natalie. And that's why we talk about informal actors, right? Is that we're talking Absolutely. about and, and the enterprises. <laughs> Um, perhaps first, Jane, Jane or Julia, is there um, any response you'd like to give to to those uh, provocations or comments? Jane, you've got your hand up. Thanks, thanks, Laura. Um, so I think going back to Usman's question, I think institutionalizing processes of consultation is really critical, and that's where the you know, the, the, the practice of having some kind of tripartite structure in each, in each uh, country, which includes organized labor, organized business, and, um, and government is really critical. A sort of mirror, imaging, a mirror imaging of the ILO process at the International Labor Con Conference. Um, and I think the challenge is, going to Natalie's point, the challenge is that generally speaking, even where those institutionalized uh, frameworks and in, uh, institutions exist, that informal business owners as well as informal workers get sidelined. So the trade union movement doesn't automatically include workers in the informal economy and businesses in their representation don't automatically include small uh, representatives of small and 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 medium sized businesses so you know it does require a push from those two constituencies to to demand inclusion into processes where there is institutionalized um, engagement 
Um, of course, where those where those institutions don't even exist, it's even more difficult. Um, but I do think that the answer lies, the question of influence lies in making sure that there's an inclusion in processes that lead to something um, where there is a guarantee when you get into that process that, you know, there will be an outcome, whether or not it's one you agree with, at least you know that there is a, a process, you know, that after the consultation, there's a referral to parliament or there's a referral to a particular government department, depending on the, um, the nature of the consultation or to a, a particular ministry. Um, and where everybody knows what the rules of the engagement are. I think that's that's the that's where the answer to influence lies. Great. Thank you. Thank you for those insights, Jane. Um, Julia. Yeah, just to add to that point precisely, um, I think Carrie's uh, uh, point there early on in the discussion was, was very important. Um, and in that framework, um, this quality of stakeholder engagement framework, um, I mentioned, you can see that, um, as Jane said, influence and in decision making is one specific aspect under uh, participation that you mentioned there. And the way we formulate it there is that the, the implementer, so the, the convener, so to speak, needs to explain how inputs um, that have, uh, how inputs uh, uh, that have been received have been used and have impacted outcomes. So it's it's explicit in there. And I think we just need to think about ourselves. We provide comments on all sorts of pieces of work of colleagues all the time. And when we see the final product, we all want to see, we check whether our input has made it in there, right? We all do. Um, and that's because we want to have an effect. And it's not even that we expect all our comments to be in the final version, so to speak. Um, but we want to know that we've made people think and that uh, there is a reason why they've been included or not, right? And and that's just pure human psychology. And if we don't, if we don't get any feedback that our comments have been received and how they've been used, whether positively or negatively, we just get frustrated. And next time we're not next time around, we're not going to invest in the process. Is we all we all know that very personally, I think. So it's it's absolutely critical that follow up and it goes back to the point that um if you don't do that people won't engage anymore thanks yeah i think very good very good points julia um we have about two minutes left um are there any other burning burning questions <laughs> i'm not sure we actually have time to answer them um, just a few reflections from my side. I mean, I, I started off by saying that there's a bit of a gap in the knowledge um, in this particular area. It's it was you know it's not easy to find the people working on the two areas simultaneously together. Um, perhaps that is changing. So I think that's that's something to maybe as a provocation to all of you here today um, to to think about. Is this is this something we should be thinking about more? Is it a gap? still a question in my mind um i think maybe it is but but um you know uh something to think about and something to talk about more and if and if any of you would like to to engage with us at the informal economy facility uh further on this issue um and please do do feel free to get in touch and then i thought there was one other question that came to mind which is is there something about the nature of environmental policy making? Because I think at its core, this is kind of an environment. I mean, it's not only an environmental issue, it's an environmental, political, economic issue. Um, but is there something about the nature of this kind of environmental issues which changes something about how the dialogue process works or about how change happens? And I'm not sure, um, you know, I think that's that's maybe something for close investigation or thinking about and certainly would be interesting to get the input of and you know colleagues working more on the environmental side um to to use to sort of get their thoughts about that i think um but i think from from us um natalie any last words from your side well last word is i mean i, I think this conversation obviously could continue it's it's a fascinating i think it's the first time we have more participants almost at the beginning than at the end. I think it's right, it's linked to the time. No, well, 
my my few takeaways and and we will stop there first obviously we are still uh, on our learning curve when it comes to engaging stakeholders um at large in partly in particularly those that are typically not engaged in uh policy processes so we are still learning and we need to be able to uh <clears throat> yeah to build the evidence uh out of this learning process today it was very nice to hear from the climate promise already like sort of compiling evidences that inclusion can lead to higher ambition uh, when it comes to uh, climate action and that actually if a process of consultation is done seriously then you can have impact and let's say at least in terms of policy change that's one but on the top of everything, uh, I would say that my key, the key words for me are recognition. First of all, there must be a recognition of the informal economy as a key agent of change uh, in a green transition. And on this, not only in terms of vulnerability and what it means in terms of protections and so forth, but also as, as an agent of change. And I think that's that's critical recognition two genuine inclusion in policy processes what it means from what i heard it means strengthening accountability mechanisms because at the end of the day that's what we are talking about it's not about organizing a policy dialogue a focus group discussion it's making sure there is a follow-up and there is a strong accountability mechanism that is being put in place this might have to go uh, alongside capacities um, develop and capacity support for, a, I mean, this genuine engagement as well. So, so that's what I'm hearing now. I think there is also a space for innovation, and I will get back to Usman's intervention uh, and and this this pilot pioneer policy dialogue that has created new basis for co-creation because that's what is needed actually it's not simply having policymakers or the key stakeholders in green transitions hearing about the needs and you know about the vulnerabilities of of informal actors but it's also about informal actors taking a stake in creating solutions policy solutions uh, uh for the good for, for 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 the society so i will stop here i think perhaps we need to think about a follow-up discussion maybe next year when we will know a bit more after cop 28 thank you also julia for flagging all these important work streams that are coming in uh, around precisely what we are talking about is nothing else but the good governance of uh, just uh, transition processes so thank you very much everyone and it was not an easy topic it's not common and 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 uh, and for me it's just the beginning of the conversation so have a good day good evening uh good afternoon and thanks again jane also for your insightful uh um contribution on the need yeah to be serious about inclusion and inclusive uh policy making thank you so much bye bye and thanks to all the participants, the chat box has been overflowed today. Thank you.